is uh, Tom Kelly from Kamiko Instruments. I, uh, I first met Tom 25 years ago when he was a professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the materials department and he very kindly allowed me to uh, spend a week using his vacuum generators scanning transmission electron microscope uh, at that time. So, uh, and uh, I, I guess we've been in touch ever since. Tom, uh, after uh, he, his undergraduate degree, was a BSME from Northeastern, and then he did his PhD at MIT. And then after that, he was at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he was eventually professor and director of the Material Science Center. And while there, he invented the local electrode atom probe, or the start of that. And on that basis, started a company, uh, um, Amargo which was subsequently uh, acquired by Amatec and uh, more recently by, by Kamika. And it's fair to say that uh, the LEAP has actually revolutionized atom pro uh, tomography. And um, Tom has been uh, very active in the material science and microscopy community. He's been director of the Microscopy Society of America. He's been um, uh, president of the International Field Emission Society and he's currently director of the Microanalysis Society and is a nominee for president and um, ele elect and is a recipient of the Presidential Science Award. So I think we have a, a, a talk today which is not only about the science but also about uh, bringing some really uh, revolutionary technology to, uh, to bear on material science. So with that, uh, please welcome Tom Kelly. Well, thank you, Lee, and it's always a pleasure to come to Hanover and uh, visit Dartmouth, uh, and uh, I, I really enjoyed coming up here. I was spending a few days on Cape Cod, so uh, a nice couple of days here. Uh, well, let me start by asking you, if I told you this image was recorded in an atom probe, would you believe me? Good. <laughs> what about if, well, why, why wouldn't you believe me? Uh, well. Yeah, it's too perfect, right? And uh, you can see these perfect rows of atoms and so on. And uh, there's also, it doesn't look like there's any atoms missing. An atom probe really only detects about half of the atoms. So uh, that, that's a, it's not a good thing. It's unfortunate, maybe. Uh, what if I, if I told you it was recorded in an electron microscope, would you believe me? Uh, maybe, a little closer, but no, you shouldn't believe that either. Uh, you know, among other things, you might get these columns of atoms in this view and so on, the, the, the bronze atoms and the blue atoms, but what about these green atoms? They're, they're only on the surface, and how do we deal with that in an electron microscope? You, you really wouldn't. Uh, you might see something different on those columns, but at any rate, the real question is, well, why couldn't we record that? Could we record it on an instrument? And that's really what I'm here to talk about today, is could we get to the point where these kinds of images are real experimental images? Um, and Well, if we could, what would we do with that? So here's a piece of work from Simon Ringer's group at the University of Sydney. Uh, it's on a high-strength aluminum alloy, and it's a precipitation-hardened alloy. And you can see here, there are some precipitates that are visible. These are visible in a TEM, visible in the atom probe. This is atom probe data. Um, but you know what? you can't explain the strengthening directly by the number or density of these precipitates. And so, and yet they, they uh, have a quite a significant strengthening during early stages of aging. So what's happening there? Well, Simon's group found and uh, really started a new way of thinking that it's actually loaded with these small clusters of atoms. So five atom clusters or bigger. And, um, and it, they developed a thinking which is called cluster hardening of these alloys. And that's quite a significant, I think, development in metallurgy. But you know what's interesting? You couldn't see those clusters in a TEM. They're just not visible. There's not enough mass thickness contrast. Or, uh, they're visible in the atom probe. But you know what? Uh, we'd like to know really a lot of details, because it's very important. But we're missing half the atoms. So if you've got clusters of five atoms, and you're only seeing two and a half, well, you're seeing one sometimes and seven and other times. Uh, we need excuse the distribution at least. What we really want is see every atom. And there are other reasons why. Uh, for example, there are devices. This would be a quantum wire, if you will. These are a sort of model of iron atoms in copper 
And that might be a useful device. But if we try to see what we were doing there, we would have a half of those atoms. And maybe they wouldn't be precisely positioned. That wire would be wiggling around. And yeah, maybe we'd get it. If you put those right next to each other, would we really resolve what's going on? Uh, and then you know, if you push it to the limit, um, this is not uh, science fiction. Single atom transistors are starting to be a reality. And if we're going to take an image of a single atom transistor, this is a scanning tunneling microscope image. But if you were trying to really see what's there in three dimensions, uh, and you get half the atoms, you'd have to take 10 images and hope you see the uh, atom five times. <laughs> or something like that. Um, but we really want to see every atom in a structure, especially as s structures get smaller and smaller. And I think I probably don't need to preach any more than that to this audience. And so the question is, well, what is the role of microscopy in what we do? And have you ever thought about that? Um, and the simple answer is, it's a feedback mechanism. Uh, and all you have to do is think about this simple case. If you were to try to thread that needle, all right? That's not a very good image. It's a little blurry. It's because it's a JPEG and stuff. But, but it's a little blurry. And it's kind of like if you've got 45-year-old eyes, it's kind of like what you can see. Um, it makes it harder. Now try doing that with your eyes closed. All right, you, what you, what you, you, got, you might eventually get that thread through that needle, but it's going to take you a lot longer. You may never get it. If you do get it, it may not be as good as if you could do it right away because you could see what you were going on. So microscopy is giving you ability to see what you're working on. It's fundamental to everything we do. If you can't see what you're working on, your result is going to probably be lesser quality, more expensive, probably less reliable, and so on. So uh, you really want a clear ability to see what you're working on. And if you're working on the atomic scale, you need an atomic scale microscope. So, this talk is really about, can we get to that point? That picture at the front is not a physical microscopy reality today, but it could be. And what we call this is atomic scale tomography. Full tomography at the atomic scale. I'll define that later. Uh, this is something that several of us have been working on for a couple of years, thinking about how to get there. Uh, Simon Ringer, by the way, is sitting right here. Uh, and Simon at the University of Sydney, Krishna Rajan at Iowa State University, and Mike Miller at Oak Ridge National Lab. And we're trying to say atom probe tomography is close to doing atomic scale tomography, but it's not there yet. Maybe even transmission electron microscopy is close. Is there a way to get there? And well, let's see that. First, it really, you're going to see it's based on, the thinking is based on atom probe tomography. So I'll give you an overview of that. Uh, I want to mention what are the limitations that we're tackling or fighting against right now. And I want you to understand, of course, there are some outstanding contributions that can be made by atom probe tomography today. It does have some real strengths. What are they? Mostly, I'll show you some good examples of what can be done. And then finish with a look towards the future. Can we get to atomic scale tomography with, based on atom probe tomography mostly? And if we could, could we really usher in an, an idea which Simon and I batted around uh, two nights ago over a couple of beers. Uh, you know, it's not novel to us. But you know, what you're really talking about is the ability to design something at the atomic scale because you can see what you're working on. We have the ability to manipulate atoms nowadays. We just need a way to see everything that's going on. So uh, let's start with that overview. Uh, this is a sort of one slide tutorial on how an atom probe works, if you haven't ever encountered an atom probe. The basic idea is we need a sharpened needle. I'll show you how we make that in a moment of, of some material. This might be about 50 nanometer radius of curvature at the apex of the needle. And we want to t apply a very high electric field to that surface. And that electric field is designed to pull positive charge out of the needle and to, uh, well, if you get that field high enough, which is about a volt across an atom, then you can actually cause what's known as field evaporation of an atom. In other words, a, a neutral atom is sitting on the surface. You put a field across an atom, it's trying to drive the nucleus one way and the electrons the other way. Eventually, one electron will tunnel through the reduced barrier. And now you've got an ion in a high electric field, and it gets going. So uh, from that basis, uh, and I'll explain it a little bit more, we have an atom probe, which is actually an interesting combination. It's a micro microscope based on point projection imaging and 
time of flight mass spectrometry. So not only do we find out where they are, we identify the species as well, as you'll see more of. So let me take these two separately to go in a little bit more depth. So first of all, time of flight mass spectrometry. We create that ion on the surface. They fly out to the detector. In time of flight, you need to know when they left and when they arrive to measure their flight time. But if you do that, um, the heavier ions, say the red ones, have a higher mass than the green ones. Actually, it's mass to charge ratio. Um, so we'll get the mass to charge ratio where n would be it, the ion lost one electron. n equals two, they lost two electrons. It's the charge state. So um, you can just say very simple kinematics. Let's say the potential energy gain across this voltage is equal to the, uh, I'm sorry, the potential energy is equal to the kinetic energy, where if you, to first order, assume it's a constant speed across that gap, then you find that the, uh, the mass to charge ratio is just going as the flight time with these other knowns. And that's the basis of time of flight spectroscopy. So um, in this case, we have typically a 100 millimeter or so flight path length at 10 kilovolts or so. And so we get flight times on the order of half a microsecond or less. Right? So actually, that means half a microsecond, or less than a microsecond means we could do it again in a microsecond, or a million pulses per second is a possibility. Um, and in order to measure flight times well and separate closely spaced masses, we need good timing resolution, or the uncertainty in the time of flight needs to be about a, a nanosecond or better. We actually achieve uh, sub-100 picosecond timing resolution in these instruments. So that's the time of flight spectrometer. How do we measure the, the, the flight arrival time is one thing. How do we measure the start time? Well, we have to pulse the evaporation event. Right? So pulsing the evaporation event means uh, two things. This is field evaporation. It's an erroneous behavior that depends on temperature, but it also depends on field. So we can pulse either one. The earliest work was done with pulsing the field because you could build a little high voltage pulser box and get going. Um, and so I just, that's why I just showed pulsing the electric field. It has the advantage that it's, uh, well, quick and dirty, uh, but it has a difficulty. It cr you're trying to measure flight time across the constant field accelerating the, the ion, but we're putting a 20% change on that. So you don't inherit the whole 20% variation, but you do inherit about 1% uncertainty in the total kinetic energy, and that smears it out. So your mass resolving power is going to be one part in 100, one part in 200 maybe, not much better. Um, the other thing is it takes a very high current in a nanosecond to raise the voltage enough. So the, the specimen better be a good electrical conductor like a metal. Um, alternative is thermal pulsing, where we hit it with a typically a laser beam, any energy source that can be focused to just heat the small tip. And we use a, like a, a, a 10 picosecond pulse with t today 355 nanometer laser. Uh, and it heats it up in 10 picoseconds, cools off in 100 picoseconds, and the, the evaporation event is somewhere in that time window, 10, about 100 picoseconds. So uh, the advantage of that is that there's no, it's a constant field, so no energy spread from that, and the specimen electrical conductivity doesn't matter. We can run aluminum oxide, and it's just fine. All right, what about the imaging? Oh, so you get a time of flight spectrum, some of these are actually clusters. You see the three isotopes of silicon, the isotopes of boron, and so on. I'll show you a few more mass spectra. The imaging part is really straightforward. You've got, uh, let's say, 50 or 100 nanometer diameter area on the top of the needle. It just flies out as if th uh, the ions fly normal to the equipotential lines, roughly as if they're projected from the center of curvature of the apex out to the detector. So, you've got a projection of a 50 nanometer area onto a 50 millimeter detector. In other words, it's a million X projection. So interatomic spacings of 0.2 nanometer here, a 0.2 millimeter on the detector, that's easy enough to build detectors that do that. So uh, that's the essential idea. One difficulty is that these detectors are based on micro channel plate amplifiers, which I'll say a little bit more, but they only detect 50% of the atoms. But once you've got the 2D position, of where the atom hit the, spe the detector. That tells us where it was on the surface before it left. Now we can map out where all the atoms were coming from on the surface. The third dimension of this 3D image comes from the sequence of evaporation events. We got 10,000 atoms per atomic layer by 100 million atoms. Every 10,000 atoms or so, the, the thickness has increased by 0.2 nanometers, roughly. And that's the sequential third dimension. So 
the output of something like that is here. Uh, this is a, a nice image that was taken of a transistor, uh, probably the 45 nanometer node. It's not absolute latest greatest. But what you see here is the source in germanium doped silicon, or SIGI. Uh, on both sides, we only got a little bit of one side, but that's the source, and the other's the drain, or vice versa. Uh, there's the, the gate dielectric here. Oxygen atoms are shown in blue. Germanium atoms are shown in red. There are some silicon atoms shown. We collect them all, or half of them, but we only display some fraction of them so you can see the other atoms. Uh, so there's a, a, a native oxide on the, the uh, gate, in this case, and so on. So each atom there, that's maybe 25 million atoms in that image. All right, we got a three-dimensional image of what's there. And companies like Intel or IBM or others would pay money to know exactly what's going on in these kinds of transistors because they need that feedback loop, right? All right, so this is a, a modern atom probe. It's a, a, a Kamika. Uh, by the way, Ian, Amatech owns Kamika. So we were not acquired twice. We were acquired once by Amatech and made, us, made part of Kamika. Um, which makes other scientific instruments. And so anyway, this is the, the local electrode atom probe, uh, model 4000X for the laser. So this is the main ultra-high vacuum instrument. It is an ultra-high vacuum technique, and the specimens that I didn't mention earlier are about 50 Kelvin. And this is a laser system for pulsing the specimen. Um, and so uh, the specimen geometry is, uh, might sound like it's daunting, but actually nowadays it's routine to make these. Um, and what we use is a specimen carrier, and you can see here there's an array of these microtips. They're about 100 micron tall. These are made by MEMS processing uh, of 100 silicon, and you can see each one of these is a little microtip. Uh, in the practice, we have a counter electrode. This is a hollow electrode with a 40 micron aperture at the apex, and it's not shown in position, but in practice, it would be moved down so that the aperture is right on top of one of these microtips and atoms fly through that to the detector. Um, these microtip arrays come in two kinds. We have them made for us and sell them to the customers. They're either sharpened, ready to go into the atom probe, uh, like 75 nanometer radius at the apex, and you can use those if you want to deposit a thin film on there. There's no more sample prep. You go right into the atom probe and, and start ripping. Uh, alternatively, actually probably 95% of all the ones we sell are this type. It's about a two micron diameter flat on the top, and it's really just used as a receptacle for things that we put there, specimens. All right, so this is a, a lift out maybe of a transistor, maybe of a, a piece of a meteorite, who knows. Um, we can use focused ion beam specimen preparation, as I'll show you here. This is a, illustrating taking transistors out of a device structure. So we can dig a couple of trenches. You dig a trench, dig a second trench, and then at an angle, so the trenches intersect subsurface. Now you've got a beam. We cut one end of the beam off and grab it with a micro manipulator, cut this off, and we lift the thing out. All right? So there you can see it lifted out. This is attached by, in the fib, you can deposit platinum with the ion beam, and that's used as glue. Um, we move it to one of the micro tips, position it, can glue it on. Uh, cut, actually glue it on or cut uh, a small piece. So here is a piece of that beam you saw where the transistors are at the top. Uh, and now, once that's in place, we could do 10 of those. Now we would move the specimen so we're looking down, and we start sharpening it like a pencil sharpener. Pretty straightforward, an annular milling pattern, uh, and make it sharper and sharper. And finally, this is the finished specimen. There's a transistor right at the top of that. And nowadays, our technicians can position things to within 5 or 10 nanometers in X, Y, and Z on the top of a needle. And so, as I say, it really has become routine if you have a modern focused ion beam instrument. Um, all right, so that's the quick intro. What about uh, the limitations of the technique? Well, uh, one thing is it doesn't really have general applicability. I mean, you know, if somebody walks into a light microscope laboratory, you can almost be assured you can get some kind of an image of it. That's not true of an atom probe. It, uh, we're not quite to the point where we run mayonnaise or whatever. Uh, we're not running biological tissues yet, but that might come. I think it will come eventually. But um, uh, also, even, even some like transistor structures or complex structures, they, they are put under a very high electric field. The stress in the specimen goes as the square of the electric field. So they will sometimes just blow up or fracture in the, in the uh, instrument. But there are other issues that I want to uh, uh, spend time on, if you can run them. And actually, nowadays, uh, we run a very large array of specimens. Um, 
The bigger issue nowadays is that there are some projection aberrations. I will show you that in a minute. Um, there also are some occasional compositional inaccuracies, inaccuracies. Mostly, atom probe is straightforward. You pull the atoms off and you cone them, and that's the composition. It's as simple as that. Uh, but there are some times I want to illustrate those in the interest of full understanding of what's going on here. Um, the detector efficiency I mentioned is 55, 60%. Actually, that's really excellent for some. And it's unfortunate we're that close to 100% and we don't get there. I'm going to say more about that in the end of the talk. Um, the field of view is somewhere less than 200 nanometers. I'd like it to be a half a micron. And you might say, why? Well, uh, you know, if the earlier microscope, the earlier atom probes had a 10 or 15 nanometer field of view. And now you start to think, what applications can I address with a 15 nanometer field of view? It limits you, all right? Whereas uh, if you have a 200 nanometer field of view, you open yourself up to many more things like whole transistors. If you have a half micron field of view, it's even more things you could go after. Maybe you start to think about pieces of cells and so on. Anyway, we want to get it up. And uh, we don't really get much crystallographic information. Simon's group has done a lot in this regard, and they are making really nice progress. But I'll show you where we think we can make improvements, especially if we get every atom. It will help. Finally, we don't really have chemical information. And by that, I mean composition is one thing, but chemistry is a separate question. Like in an electron microscope, you can get electron energy loss spectroscopy. That's real chemical bonding information. We don't get that in the atom probe. So uh, I'll just go a little bit more in depth into these first two uh, as the limitations and then move on. And ultimately, we're going to talk about how could we address these remaining limitations. Um, the projection aberrations mostly are not a too big a deal, but there are particularly difficult aspects in some multi-phased specimens. So the projection is simply, you know, let's say to first order that's a spherical cap on the end of a needle. The, the atoms project from the center of curvature of that apex. And it's a nice, simple projection. And that means the magnification, as you can see, is uh, d over r. Well, there's an image compression factor corrector there, but I won't go into that detail. The problem is that real specimens don't necessarily have a nice, simple end shape. Here's a model example where there's a, a hard phase inside of a softer phase. Typically, it takes a higher electric field to evaporate a harder phase or a higher melting temperature material, higher cohesive strength material. And so this is a phase that has a higher electric field needed to evaporate. And you can see once it reaches the surface, it sort of hangs on longer. Eventually, you do evaporate it all, and, it, and the surface shape reverts. Um, that creates problems because the trajectories are dictated by this the field lines. And if the field lines are now changed markedly, it changes the trajectories. And so an atom that hits the detector here, we don't really know how to send it back to where it belongs on the sample. Uh, we're trying to fix that. Uh, here's another example, again, simulation where you can see multi-layered structures. And the uh, copper, especially, is a low field material. The cobalt's a high field. And you can see the change in shape. So these shapes not only are not simple projections, but they evolve as the specimen erodes. So really, to fix this, we've got to think about how do we need to know the specimen shape, apex shape throughout the atom probe experiment. That's not an easy task, but that's what I'll be addressing momentarily. Uh, here are some real images of real samples. In fact, it's as simple as this is a single crystal silicon with a, a SiO2 layer and then a polysilicon coat on that. We're looking at it in cross-section, and you can see the difference in curvature here from here. It's both silicon. What's going on? Well, we don't fully understand some things like that. Um, Here's a multi-layer structure where you can see the undulations. This is a TEM image. That's an SEM image. So TEM image, again, you see in the complexity of that surface. And this is one of the most extreme I've ever seen. This is uh, basically silicon with a SiO2 on either side. And you can see the uh, really marked effect on the shape of the apex there. Um, in fact, so what's the big deal? Well, the problem is that we, what we want is uniform magnification across. And what we're getting is variations that depend on the shape that we don't know. So uh, the, the simple answer is we need to know uh, what the shape is to fix this. Uh, and I'll say more about that. What about composition? Well, this is a most, probably the most egregious example I've run into in many years. Uh, when we first started running compound semiconductors with laser pulsing, this is gallium nitride. And we're expecting to measure the composition as 50% gallium, 50% nitrogen. And what did we get? 80% gallium, 20%. Um, so what we found, OK, you got to go to lower and low laser pulse energy. And we found a nice, simple trend. It's moving towards 
the correct stoichiometry, we were just hitting it with too high a uh, laser energy, heating it up too much, and what we were finding is that the, the galliums were uh, still evaporating long after the laser pulse was turned off, and we weren't capturing them. Uh, actually, in our first generation instrument, uh, our laser pulse uh, design, we, weren't, we did not anticipate this one, and we did not have enough dynamic range to go to low enough laser energies on that, although actually we could put in a neutral density filter, but then you'd cut off the high end and you wouldn't be able to run the metals and stuff. So uh, anyway, our second generation design, we went from like three orders of magnitude dynamic range to six orders of magnitude and solved that problem. But now we can get to the low enough laser energies. Uh, there's still a concern that even with the low laser power per pulse, um, we got the correct composition, but we're starting to see the background levels increase, which has to do with uh, atoms evaporating uh, between pulses and stuff. All right, all right. that's sort of one source of compositional inaccuracy. I think for the most part we can generally deal with that and understand it. Here's another one that's not as easy to deal with, which is uh, sometimes you have peak interferences. This is time of flight mass spectrometry, and nice, yeah, you see not only the, the uh, boron, you see the boron isotopes, boron 11 and boron 10. And this is at a mass to charge state ratio of 10, as, you know, mass of 10 and charge of 1. But this is in silicon, where boron is uh, doped at, I don't know, let's say 50 part per million. There's silicon everywhere, including not just silicon plus ones or silicon plus twos. There's even some silicon plus threes here. Silicon has three isotopes, 28, 29, and 30. Plus three means that there's a peak. Some of this peak is silicon, silicon 30. Uh, so that is a direct interference. Uh, and what we can do, if we take a volume, say, OK, in this volume, we want to know the composition, fine. We, got, uh, we know the ratio of these two for naturally occurring isotope ratios, and we can deconvolute that. We get the composition in a volume. But in an image, when you want to display a boron hit, we don't know whether that's really a boron on a silicon. We just know it landed at 10. And the image has more noise, and it's not good. All right, so let's now focus on the strengths. Well, um, the, one of the important things to understand that these images are discrete 3D images, not just uh, analog uh, functions in space. So they're made up of atoms one at a time throughout their, and their 3D positions. Actually, it's one of the problems with the visualization software. Most visualization software is on a regular XYZ grid, and you just have a value there, and you can display it. We have uh, single atoms at some floating point XYZ position, maybe even a double precision floating point. Most software is not set up to deal with that. They just want to put it, what, what, tell me what grid point to put it on. It's not on a grid point. Uh, anyway, um, the, another nice thing is that it's, uh, we do not have any variation in atom detection efficiency with atomic number. So hydrogen is detected just as well as uranium. It's nice. Um, the, the, the really, the spatial resolution in most samples that don't have these aberrations we're worried about, it's really 0.3 nanometer, even we've demonstrated a little better. Uh, and it's potentially in all three directions. The, the longitudinal direction is a little bit better than the lateral direction uh, in general, and depending on whether you're near some aberration sources. But, um, but it's really 0.3 nanometer is a fair number in general. Another thing that's very important to understand, if you're not familiar with atom probe tomography, uh, it's a high analytical sensitivity technique. You can go to one part per million. It has the signal to noise strength to do that. Not many techniques you'll see can say that. It's a very unusual combination of high sensitivity, high spatial resolution. And actually, I'll put this on a, a plot for you. Uh, realize also that uh, it's important. That's great. But if it took you six months to get the data, it would have a very different application opportunity. The, the, it's, this is very much like going to a transmission electron microscope that everybody understands. You can go in in the morning and expect to come out in the afternoon with uh, an answer or information, at least. Um, and in fact, the specimen preparation, most of that stuff you saw with the FIB, that was developed for TEM, and we just shamelessly borrowed the, the techniques and uh, utilized them. Uh, so it's very similar, no, well-known stuff. The detection efficiency, actually, I said that was a limitation. It's also a strength. 55% is actually a good high number. All right, so I mentioned uh, it's an unusual combination of analytical sensitivity, uh, which is analytical sensitivity here. Can you detect 10 part per million or 10 part per billion or what, so on? Uh, versus lateral spatial resolution or generally spatial resolution, you should recognize that there's, there's nothing. This is no man's land here. You can't, there are not, you can't do part per trillion analysis on two atoms. Right? Th that's unphysical. So you need a trillion atoms to do part per trillion. So there's, this is 
not, not occupied. So the, the major part of this curve, of this graph, that's not occupied is this opening here. And when, oh, I hit the wrong button. Uh, you look at the atom probe is exactly what fills in this niche area, if you will, of high spatial resolution, high analytical sensitivity. It's a uh, really nice thing. And it does it in a discrete 3D image. So let's look at a few applications. Uh, here's one I particularly uh, think is, I'm fond of this. Uh, the guys in the lab went to Best Buy and bought an Intel i5 processor. Open up the box. I can show you all that stuff. Uh, we you know, get, get rid of the plastic packaging and stuff, get down to the business part of it, go to the fib. They lifted out some transistors, and here's an actual image. Now, you might say, wouldn't Intel freak out if they knew I was showing this? Uh, actually, no. Anything, as soon as it leaves the Intel factory, they know that uh, the world will dissect it, uh, inspect it, correct it, whatever. Um, so here's, uh, again, you see silicon germanium, the source and drain. Here's uh, oxygen that's in red. Oxygen atoms at the gate. And then what are these other atoms? Th these are boron atoms in blue and arsenic atoms. These are the dopants in the transistor. And you can see the distribution of the dopant atoms in the, um, in the transistor. In fact, a little more detail here. You can see just the boron illustrating. There's more, for, curiously, and I you know, can't go to Intel and say, can you explain why you did this? They're not going to tell us, but uh, there's more boron on either side of the channel than in the center. The arsenic is pretty uniform, interestingly enough. Um, and then even more interesting, perhaps, is we found carbon there. Well, actually, carbon is known to be used in small amounts to, to uh, uh, quiet uh, impurity uh, defects and stuff. But unfortunately, for, well, I think it's unfortunate for the processing, the, it's, it's found to be clustering. And how do we know? Well, much like uh, Simon's group work, uh, you, can, you can say, OK, you know how many carbon atoms are there? Now, if, if they were randomly distributed in space, tell me uh, the, the distribution of intercarbon atom distances. All right, that's the uh, red curve. All right, so this is, oh, sorry, this is kind of small. This is the separation versus the number that they find. So you would expect a random distribution of carbon to give you that sort of, uh, say, cluster signature. But it's not that. It's, uh, it's definitely to smaller separation. So on average, carbons are separated less than a random distribution would say. In other words, they are clustered, and we can quantify the clusters. There are 29 of these clusters found, and they have a size, and so on. Uh, of course, there's only 50% of the atoms detected, so we would like to do better. Uh, and you know, this is a sort of portent of what could be. Um, if you take that data, the, the atoms in that Intel processor, uh, Williams Lefebvre at the University of Rouen in France uh, took a stem image of not that same transistor, but an identical one, I think. I mean, it was supposed to be identical. Uh, and this, this is an overlay of the atom probe data on the TEM data. Uh, a nice effect, but really, wouldn't we like to just put them all together from the same transistor? Uh, we'll see. So uh, another example from a compound semiconductor, actually very similar, a commercial light-emitting diode. We ripped it apart. Uh, you can see in here the business end are some quantum wells. These are the quantum wells here. It's an indium-doped gallium nitride, the indium in the um, quantum wells. And what are there? Seven of these quantum wells are about two nanometer thick. But one of the problems these things have, and we found one, is they grow from a sapphire uh, substrate, and there are uh, threading dislocations, as they're called, dislocations that grow from the substrate up. These cause problems, and it's, here's a blatant example of that. The, the growth, uh, actually, you tend to get V-shaped, uh, hollowed out regions where the threading dislocation is. And you see what it does to the quantum wells in this area. So I can assure you that those quantum wells are not emitting photons the way they're designed uh, in that region. Furthermore, you can see above it, there's a magnesium doping is used in gallium nitride structures and so on. And in fact, we saw in there, uh, here is, is a different coloration, but above that, actually, you can see the threading dislocation above that V-shaped defect, um, and it's decorated with magnesium. So the magnesium dopants are segregating to a, a dislocation core, and you can look down the dislocation core and see that. You can actually get a composition profile and see there's a significant increase in magnesium dopant at that dislocation core. It's an illustration. We've seen this uh, decoration dislocations in many materials and so on. What about in uh, here, Darfield uh, imaging in a stem shows you uh, this is a multi-layer uh, structure designed to make quantum dots, where each one of these 
bright regions is an indium-rich region. It's a quantum dot. Could we see those in a nanoprobe? And this is work with Alfred Cerezo at Oxford. Um, well, actually, we can see the indium-rich layers. Uh, and then if you put an ISO concentration surface on there, that is, you, you say, take a small volume of voxel and calculate the composition of indium in there. If it's above 10%, say it's inside the surface. And so this surface then encloses regions of high indium concentration. So there you see it at some indium concentration. Jack the indium concentration requirement up, and it isolates regions of even higher indium concentration. In other words, the quantum dots. And you can turn off the other atoms and see this with a little perspective. So you can very clearly see the quantum dots in these. Just an illustration of uh, another thing you can do. And what about other nanostructures like nanowires? Danny Perea at, and Lincoln Lahan at Northwestern have done some nice work. Uh, they, they grow nanowires. One of the burning questions in this technology, which is called uh, uh, liquid vapor solution growth, is you put a gold catalyst in there. The germanium gas, uh, germane, dissolves germanium in here, and then it precipitates out and grows a wire. But the gold moves up, the germanium wire grows. But is there, eventually, the gold all disappears. So where did it go? Did it go into the wire, or did it vaporize? Uh, that an the answer to that was surprisingly not known until this work. Uh, and they found basically zero gold down here. Uh, so it must be vaporizing. Uh, the other thing is they added some phosphor-bearing gas. It might have been phosphine to dope it. And you can see here the phosphorus in black atoms, the phosphorus doping distribution in a nanowire. A very nice piece of work. Uh, the, the, another thing, you can, you can now run pure dielectrics. We, five years ago, certainly, maybe three years ago, we weren't sure if a dielectric would run in a nanoprobe because you apply a high voltage to a dielectric, the fields just penetrate, they don't even notice, maybe. Well, there must be surface defects and stuff because the fields are high enough to evaporate the atoms. And at any rate, uh, this is a, a structural alumina that uh, has some carbon doping, and the expectation was its distribution uh, it segregates to the grain boundaries. This is some work Emmanuel Marquis at Michigan that did. And um, she made specimens, and you can see here, this is a grain boundary. You can actually identify the grain boundaries in a FIB or in the SEM, make a specimen from that region, and here's the grain boundary. You can see there's a lot of carbon segregation to that grain boundary in alumina. I used, I used to work with Yet Ming Chang, uh, or I knew his work at uh, MIT doing uh, work on a field emission stem. It's very difficult to see carbon in alumina with any electron microscopy technique, and this is a fairly straightforward here. All right, last one. Um, no, second to last. Uh, here's a, an example of uh, a zircon, which is a uh, uh, high melting temperature mineral that actually tends to survive even magma flows and is used because, it, uh, in geology, it's used for geochronology because it survives some of these things. And here's an example of a small grain that survived um, melting. And then there was a regrowth or resorption front of more uh, zirconium deposit on there. And they can actually tell from details around here what might happen, partly from the uranium that gets deposited decays and you get a lead 206 signature. The question is, could we see it? Well, this is an electron microprobe work where you can see the yttrium uh, at the resorption front, as it's called. Uh, and there's some hafnium signature here. But the, the real story here is, could we make an atom probe specimen from the resorption front in a piece of zircon and uh, get any real inter interesting data? Um, and here you can see the yttrium uh, image where you can see segregation of the yttrium at the resorption front. And um, probably more importantly, uh, you can see that the uranium is segregated to that same front. And um, you can see, we indeed see the lead 206. And uh, if you know the, the, the science, you can date that rock rather precisely depending on the counting statistics. The counting statistics of this rather small volume are pretty good, but not great. But we get absolutely the correct answer to within a few percent, which was limited by the uh, counting statistics of that small volume. So this was a real interesting find, and the geological community, especially geochronology, is taking a lot of notice. Um, last example is um, it's time of flight spectroscopy. We, I said we could see hydrogen to uranium. Could we really see hydrogen? Do you know of any technique where you can map hydrogen, in, especially spatially, in 3D? Well, here's an example, some really nice work. Uh, Hiro Hono's group uh, in, uh, at Scuba, in Scuba in Japan, they took an a iron neodymium boron mag magnet material uh, powder. And you can see the, uh, in these uh, stem images, the bright phase is 
uh, neodymium-2 hydrogen, at least that's the understanding. And in this atom probe data, what you see is you plot the neodymium and the hydrogen. Very clearly, you see the hydrogen associated with those bright phases. There's actually even a little boron and gallium segregation to it. And uh, I didn't include the slide, but if you do the composition analysis, you get absolutely 66% hydrogen, 33% neodymium, uh, where it should be. All right, now let's wrap up a, a little bit with a look to the future. And starting with, uh, uh, this is just a little progression that, you know, it, field ion microscopy was the first microscopy to see atoms in 1955, at, Professor Erlen Mueller's lab at the Penn State University. Uh, this is a field ion microscope from the mid-60s at Oxford. It's a glass-based system, and uh, to me that looks a little bit ancient, maybe not to all of us, but um, uh, by the mid-80s, the, the advent of the atom probe, one-dimensional atom probe for the most part, this is a, 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 a photograph of a one-dimensional atom probe. Actually, doesn't look so ancient to me. Um, but it, it is kind of a, a throwback. You can see the evolution of the instrument to a, uh, it's now all metal structures and a lot more electronics and so on. Uh, you fast forward to where atom probe tomography has come. Uh, so say this is a photograph of a modern atom probe. The question is, where is this going? Where could we take it? What I would say is I consider this to be sort of the, um, maybe the second generation of uh, real atom probe tomography. What is the next generation? And that's what really I want to wrap up with. Um, and start by asking the question, um, what is, in a sense, uh, you know, the best we could do? It's important to think about that a little. Uh, and I use this analogy here. Let's say I claim that atoms are the smallest building block that, from which structures are made or engineered. You might say, well, what about protons or quarks? And so, or in fact, if we made, what is the ultimate microscope? If we made an atom scale microscope where you could see every atom and position them precisely, would that be it? And you might say, well, what about a proton microscope? Well, what about a quark microscope? Uh, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, if we have a way to find out the structure of a quark, or all six quarks, or however many there are, each one's different, we know some about that. But I would argue, as far as we know, every up quark in the universe is the same. I don't know that any, anything that says it's not true. Same, every proton, as far as I know, in the universe is the same. So once we determine their structure, uh, we don't need to do it again necessarily. Maybe finer information, but you won't, do, what is a microscope? Do, well, I would argue microscopes are all about finding out what's there, what's unique. Once you do it once and you're done, well, that's maybe a different story. So, well, at this scale, we're looking at a building and I'd say, let's say, in principle, if that building was made up of some finite number of building blocks, bricks, different types of bricks, like 10 different bricks, but we knew that each brick was identical to the next, then what would you need to know about that building to know just about everything there is to know? Well, if you knew the position and identity of every brick in 3D, and I happen to pick a building that looks kind of like an atom probe specimen, but that was by design. But um, I'm saying you, you would know everything that's there. And so if you say that atoms really are the building block of things that we experience, that we make, or that nature makes, is there any need to go to a higher level microscope? I'm willing to admit that I don't know enough, but what I know today, I say no, there is no higher quality microscope than if you can map out all the atoms in a specimen. Uh, I hope to be proven wrong someday. Uh, if, anyway, so. Um, question is, could we do this, learn where every building block in a, any arbitrary structure is on the atomic scale, and, well, maybe, maybe not, would this be an ultimate microscope? Um, uh, we're, I'm arguing yes with some uh, understanding that we don't know what we don't know. But let, let's put this in perspective, and this is a, a slide that comes from Simon's group. Uh, we are, we're sort of almost there, like high resolution TEM, you can see every atom. No, that's not right. You can see columns of atoms, all right? How, how deep are those columns? They're 50 atoms deep, all right? So this is an aluminum alloy. It's got aluminum and zinc and magnesium and copper. All right, so uh, I want to see where all the copper atoms are. And it's like, ah, not, not going to get that. Not from that. Actually, it's a beautiful image, and it does really important things, but it doesn't give you that. Uh, well, actually, 
Simon's group, Michael Moody, Moody in particular, led an effort to say, OK, let's take atom probe tomography data, figure out where the lattice is, put the atoms on that lattice. Oh, wait, yeah, we're missing 40-something percent of them. We'll infer what that should be by statistical num uh, numbering and create what's called a lattice rectified atom probe data set. It's actually getting pretty close to what we call atomic scale tomography. Uh, it's still missing the, oh, the 40 atoms or 40 percent of the atoms are by inference. But uh, what you see is now we've got the same image and we see in the columns, but we know the identity of every atom in each of those columns. All right? Uh, and uh, it's, it's different information, very important information, especially if these clusters are really what is important in strengthening these alloys and so on. So this is just a various information. You can get, extract all kinds of further information. Um, and the point is that all right, this is close, but it's not there. What would it take to get there? In fact, what is there? Well, I want to define here atomic scale tomography. All right. First of all, you need 100% of the atoms. And in fact, when I say 100%, do I, need, do I mean absolutely 100? I'd like to think so, but I know that real detectors have occasional noise and missing things. So I'll give you, if we can get to 99% or 99.9, .9, I would feel very good. But you know, if you remember back to that atom, an image of a single atom transistor, there were little vacancies around. Uh, you know, if we could get 100%, we would be able to say, well, there's some vacancies there because there's no atom showing in the data. Uh, that would be worth going after. I recognize it's not a trivial uh, thing to go after. Um, uh, nicely, the atom probe does give you the isotopes in addition. We want to position those atoms precisely enough to do real space crystallography and maybe other things. We want to also make sure we don't have mistakes like, are those boron or are those silicon? We have a peak interference. I want to clean that up. Can we? Uh, and finally, we, we want to do this imaging, not just on a 100 nanometer volume, but, well, at least the next scale. I, I think this is very important. Uh, TEM can show you all the atoms in a graphene sheet, but can it do it in a chunk that came out of a, a, an airplane, a chunk of metal? No. You need to do large enough volumes to be practically useful, and I'd like to get us to this point where we're seeing sort of half micron volume. Well, what was it, what's it going to take? Well, right now, we don't have 100%. We need a new detector. Right now, we don't have the position we have aberrations. Well, if we can image the shape of the apex, maybe we can fix that. So we need information maybe from a TEM, maybe a scanning probe microscope. We'll see. What about uh, fixing these atoms? I'm going to talk about we need new and larger detectors. So let's go after that. That's two topics, A and B. First one then, can we go to 100% detection efficiency? Well, right now, the reason we don't detect them, as I mentioned, is microchannel plates. The ions fill out, hit a microchannel plate, which produces an amplified signal, and the, the readout anode tells us where the atom hit. Um, and so they do give us like 100 picosecond timing resolution, 1K by 1K resolution across the detector. Um, I'm not going to go into that one, but one of the things I mentioned this, and we haven't talked about, they don't give us any kinetic energy information, but what if they did? Well, first of all, the reason we get 60% is shown here. This is the front face of a microchannel plate. These are the microchannels. When an ion lands inside, it gets amplified. When it lands on the web in between, it stops and nothing happens. So you miss 60% of the atoms, or 40%. Um, um, but it does all this nice stuff. This is not easy to do, and it does a nice job of it. And it gives us no variation in detection efficiency. But how could we go better? Well, I've been sort of looking for something for years and decades. And it wasn't until, actually, I read this article in Scientific American in 2006. Uh, Kent Irwin was writing about superconducting detectors. And what you see here is a sea of superconducting, not atoms, but the, the Cooper-paired electrons. It sort of schematically showed those whirling, two electrons whirling around each other. They travel in spin-coupled pairs called a Cooper pair. And there's a binding energy of about 3 milliEV in low-temperature superconductors. And so what's interesting is, could we make a detector, which is basically a coating uh, of superconductor, where we'd get a signal that would 100% of the area would be covered. And, um, and if it does, these, uh, well, bottom line is that superconductors have 3 milliEV bonding energy. So if you send in a particle, it creates, it breaks those pairs. And now you have liberated electrons, becomes a signal that you can detect. And actually, 
a 5 keV ion would create more than a million broken pairs. That's a lot of signal. That's adequate signal for us to work with. And it does it in 10 picoseconds or less. So it's all good. We just have to figure out how to use this phenomenon. And uh, so right now, we're sort of exploring how to get this done. I think that there's a real prospect that it'll eventually work, but it, we're at a very early stage of that. At any rate, um, I, I would hope also we could get to a, a large detector. Well, what would we do? One of the things I mentioned is, you know what? The number of broken paired electrons is directly proportional to the kinetic energy of the incoming particle. So this is like, ooh, there's another opportunity there. Um, here is that same problem, that the boron on silicon, or in this case, uh, the, the blue solid line is a, a model, but it's a, uh, a mass spectrum. And it's made up, in this case, as I illustrate, of uh, nitrogen at 14, nitrogen plus 1, and silicon 28. And this is the plus 2 peak of silicon, silicon 28, 29, 30. And uh, uh, unfortunately, this, this peak here is a combination of some nitrogen and some silicon. We don't know how much. Um, there's another kind, this is one interference I called category two type interference. Another one is this one, where uh, th there is, uh, and you can read about this if you're interested in the details, but um, in this case, curiously, we have a peak of, at 16, that'd be oxygen plus one. But what happens if an O2 molecule evaporates as a plus two? It has a mass to charge of 16, it lands right on top of it. So I don't know whether the count hits as one atom or two atoms. There's another type of discrepancy or interference. So, well, you know what? If these superconducting detectors tell us the kinetic energy, well, ha, the oxygen 2 at 5 kV is going to arrive with 10 keV, and the O1, or plus 1, is going to arrive with 5 keV. And so that's what I've illustrated here, that if you plot, instead of a mass spectrum, we plot a mass energy spectrum, and we get at 5 keV, uh, some oxygen plus ones, and at 10 keV, oxygen plus, or hits at this slight time, but at this kinetic energy, those must be O2 plus plus. And so we're now getting more information and able to separate some of these discrepancies. The nitrogen plus one at 14, and the silicon 28 plus two at 14 are now separated in kinetic energy. And there's some other things we could do with it without going into detail. Uh, I mentioned that the voltage pulsing mode, we typically pulse about 20% of the voltage. Well, that means any ions that evaporate between pulses are standing at 80% of the field, not 100%. And so they went show up down here at 4 keV. Um, and oops, what did I do? Uh, so that's a hazard with these. Um, so the, uh, we might even filter the noise out of the data. And now time for me to start wrapping up. So. Um, the, the idea is this would allow us to build a detector with a superconducting uh, detector or an instrument that would have maybe 100% detection efficiency, kinetic energy separation of some of these peak interferences. Uh, it would also allow us to do a better job even a voltage pulse instrument. And we could build now a shorter flight path instrument that still separates all the atoms. And so we would get a larger field of view and a higher repetition rate because it's a shorter flight time. All kinds of good things happen. And this is where things are headed, at least in this regard. What about fixing the aberrations? Well, uh, this is the problem I mentioned. We need, what do we need to do to fix it? We need the tip shape. If we knew the tip shape, we could figure out where those atoms came from. How do we get it? In fact, we need it through the entire atom probe experiment. Um, we might get it from a form of microscopy. And I think electron microscopy has some real opportunities to deliver that. It's going to be challenging, but I'll point it out. Uh, I think you could maybe use a scanning probe instrument like an AFM, but it's kind of a large distance? Yeah. People who really know scanning probe instruments will usually shake their head. And, uh, I'm not, it, it's scary. Uh, field ion microscopy is another possibility. I won't go into those details. Um, another possibility, however, though, is not experimental. It's actually simulation. Can we, if we know enough about the specimen, model it, field evaporate it in the computer, and that'll give us the tip shape as it evolves in the simulated experiment? Maybe that's good enough. What do we use for a model? Well, we could maybe start with the actual data that's reconstruction but has problems. Use that as the first go and iterate. We'll see. That's a possibility. The problem is, doing this work, you need to simulate the field. And ideally, you'd do it after every atom leaves and recalculate the field on a finite element method. With, uh, it, it could take months of calculating to do one. Uh, we're, we're trying to speed these things up to do it in days, but it's a tri not a trivial exercise. Anyway, I want to concentrate and finish up with look at, could we do this with electron microscopy? Uh, 
Simon's group, again, has done some very nice work with working with Tim Peterson uh, to uh, describe a technique called surface tangent algorithm work. It's a tomography in a TEM where you, let's say you, all you really want to know is the outline of the specimen with high resolution. You can quick take an image, rotate a little bit, take another one, and however many images you need, and you can piece them together to create that surface. Or you can do it also with internal surfaces, as is illustrated here. Um, and in fact, Tim did this work. He showed this is the first, uh, to my knowledge only, I don't know, you may have done more of it, um, image of a tip taken by surface tangent algorithm tomography in a TEM or STEM, and uh, it gives you the tip shape. Very nice. There's, we'll do that. That was the first time, and it wasn't quite enough information at that point. Uh, you can also represent the same information as a height uh, above some distance or some place. Uh, but fundamentally, either way, those, that is the tip shape. That's what we need. Uh, I think this is really the way to go. The question is, can we do it experimentally in an economical way and really get there? So uh, we'll also point out, we like to do it after, say, every couple of atoms evaporate. But realistically, what we expect is we take, take a t snapshot and then evaporate for a while, and then take another snapshot. And, and how often we have to do that, we don't know yet. But there are models that allow us to take a given shape and propagate that uh, effectively and efficiently. And uh, Daniel Haley, again working with Simon, has done a lot of that nice work. And, and so I think we have a plan. One way of doing this would be to build an atom probe inside of a really nice aberration corrected ultra high vacuum stem. Uh, and this is called megabuck microscopy, <laughs> if you recognize. Uh, but the idea, and we've looked at this seriously. Well, this is a neon stem. There's a company in Seattle that makes these. Um, this will deliver sub 0.1 nanometer resolution. Uh, maybe not with an atom probe inside it, but we, we would build the atom probe inside the pole piece. The ions would fly out here. Um, and at any rate, this is, a, uh, I think, a realistic process, project. We actually. Um, called this the Atom Project for Atomic Scale Tomography and proposed this or got to the point of almost proposing it to the Department of Energy who had a line item in the budget but it got nixed by a, uh, a congressional committee uh, the year before last and has not been put back in. So it never actually got fully considered but we're continuing to try to pursue funding. But you know an alternative is to say well this is approach A, put a stem or a leap in a stem. What about putting a stem on a leap? And oh, what did I do? Oh, yeah. So the idea is, well, here's that same LEAP 4000. Could we add some electron column that's good enough to give us the imaging? And I, uh, without going into all the details, I think this has some real prospects for doing the job adequately. We need to really verify that. But this would be a much more palatable solution. I think it would be, uh, it would still be maybe megabuck microscopy, but not as many megabucks. Uh, anyway, it, um, it, and it also is something that I think we could uh, integrate much more readily into the uh, existing technology. So, uh, in fact, there's already a sort of pilot project. Brian Gorman at the Colorado School of Mines bought a, he got an NSF funded grant to buy an atom probe from us and a main chamber because he wanted to put an electron column on there to do what he calls dynamic atom probe. If you know anything about dynamic TEM, they're, they're doing pulse and uh, picosecond, or well, no, nanosecond duration electron pulses at a specimen, taking a snapshot. And he wants to do that in the atom probe. But geez, he's got an ultra high vacuum, 30 kV SEM on one of our chambers. Uh, this is a side chamber, so we can get the whole thing working. And um, we're actually going to explore some imaging with that and see if we can't make some adequate progress. So um, I'll, I'll, I've got about a couple more slides, and I'm done. Um, the last thing I would say is, you know, when you do all that, we're going to generate lots of information. We need to do a better job of basically automating the analysis so that you can take the data, and, but actually have the computer tell you what it found. And multivariate statistical analysis is a very powerful tool for doing this. And I won't go into the details, but it, could, it has the potential to give us automatic phase identification. It'll find, yeah, there's an iron-rich phase, there's a boron-rich phase, and so on. It also will find uh, very low-level signals that the human would be hard-pressed to find. Uh, you could use that to filter noise out of the data, or even um, also finding very complex correlations. It's something that absolutely humans would not be good at. Uh, like segregation to a grain boundary, you may not recognize it, but it would find it. You can even find instrumental artifacts and pull them out of the data and improve your data. So what would this look like? I'll just quickly show. So we did some work with Mike Keenan. He's the real uh, brains behind this work. Um, 
Uh, this just shows, uh, this was a real uh, uh, steel, and it shows an, an interphase boundary, and you can see it found the phase one, phase two, and something. This is the segregation to a grain boundary. There's a lot of oxides in there, and it shows the mass spectrum of that and everything. Um, in fact, here's an example of that. You've got, in this case, a, uh, another alloy, but it has an NIA, Na3Al phase on one side. It's called, this is a principal component analysis. Ferrite on the other side, and then this is basically, these are the components as a mass spectrum. You can see a lot of different oxides. This is the grain boundary structure. There's a lot of oxides, different types of oxides at that grain boundary. And here is that case. So this is the principal component one, which is Ni3Al, ferrite, and the grain boundary. All right, so I think there's a big future for that kind of work as well. So let's put it all together, and I'll wrap up. The idea we're thinking here is, um, well, we're going to generate electron microscopy information, atom probe information. We actually have an opportunity to take it even a step further and say, um, let's say we call this a meta image. We're trying to assemble information from multiple sources. So we might have uh, the ability, this is what I call a portal. You move your portal around. And now, what I'd like to see is all of these things change in real time as you move your portal around. So for example, you have the atom probe data. Uh, but we could actually have modeling that shows the uh, this is the electric field in that region, or uh, we might get electron energy loss spectroscopy information from that, couple that in. Um, what about the microstructural information? I mean, this is a TEM image of that same area. Um, we might also, uh, back to that same image, get the atomic structure at that level, maybe even take it a fraction pattern. Heck, if we know all that information, uh, as Simon has suggested, we could even calculate what the TEM image will look like. Who needs a TEM at that point? Um, and finally, um, uh, measure, most importantly perhaps, measure properties or infer properties. If you really believe that we can model with computational material science this, the properties of materials when we know where every atom is, we know where every building block is, then we're done. Maybe we've closed the loop finally and we can use a characterization tool not only to give us information about what's there but what's possible and what will that actual device behave like mechanically, electrically, thermally and so on. So what we're really saying is we're building not just a microscope but a structure properties microscope where we get the structure and can compute the properties through computational material science, couple those. Fortunately, this is all on a scale that they're all coupled. So um, the last slide is okay. I told you what the limitations are. I don't know, I mean, we're, we're working on that. I'm not as worried about that, but look at what I've talked about in principle will address all of these limitations. We would fix them all, hopefully, with the Atom Project. And in the end, that would say we've got everything uh, in achieving atomic scale tomography. And that might be a reality in the not too distant future. Thank you. Yes, actually, but not in the atom probe. You do it in silico, meaning when you've got that much information at the atomic scale and you want to see how it evolves, you, you should be doing that with simulation or, you know, uh, maybe it's good, maybe it could be better, but certainly 20 years from now it should be adequate to evolve that, you know, if you say uh, put temperature on that structure, once you know the structure for one, you have a snapshot. And in fact, what you could do is uh, let's say, okay, I'm gonna, I need to know this. I'm going to take real materials from uh, a, a one-minute heat treatment and a one-hour heat treatment, and I get a, a meta image for both, and then I want to see does the uh, computer simulation evolution of this to that match the reality that we just measured? If so, then you've got the ability to take snapshots and interpolate between them. Now, I, if, I'm not sure that's fully answering your question, but that's... Yes, it, it is destructive. Uh, I 
said this earlier today, it's microscopically destructive, <laughs> which is, uh, it's still destructive. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it, it, yeah, so um, you, you can't, we haven't figured out how to put the atoms back yet, but uh, on Star Trek, they have figured that out. Uh, okay, great. Well, uh, yeah, so if you can do all of that with inorganics, what can you do with organic materials, uh, and especially proteins and stuff? Well, um, first and foremost, probably we have to deal with making the specimen, uh, of course, and uh, stuff like proteins, probably we would go to cryogenic preparation. We've actually been exploring that. You developed a cryotransfer uh, uh, accessory for the LEAP. What we needed then is uh, Basically, if you're making specimens in a fib, you need a cryostage in a fib, you need the ability to grab the micro-manipulator, grab it and put it on a thing and, and then sharpen it. Now you've got to transport that to the leap, you keep it cold and keep it protected from water and other atmosphere. So actually, all of that is in place except now the cryo-micro-manipulator. I thought we would see those in, uh, even commercially a couple years ago, but they haven't arrived yet. But last week I was at the University of Oregon and Jeff Ditto there has done it. He's just didn't believe that you couldn't do it, so he went off and did it himself uh, with TEM specimens he's going to try to do with an atom probe. So we were like on the cusp of having cryo preparation for organic water even. We could run ice. Uh, um, and if that, that's the big holdup. We've done a bunch with different organic materials, but it's all been what can you do of relevance that can be prepared at room temperature in a fib. And we've done synthetic polymers. Okay, the, to finish the second part of that is, when you run uh, aluminum alloy, you see the aluminum peak, you see the magnesium peak, you see the copper peak. We understand everything that's going on. Well, when you run a synthetic polymer, you get a carbon atom and a C2 cluster and a C3 cluster. Oh, and by the way, the C2 cluster, there's four peaks there. There's C2H2, C2H3, C2H4. And then, uh, so you start to add more peaks, a little more complex, but uh, on the scale of complexity of some mass spectral analyses, it's not that bad. I also do think that there's some opportunities for us to push towards uh, eliminating those clusters and do real single atom uh, evaporation. We don't know how to do it fully yet, but we have some ideas. So those are the challenges. I do think that when you make them cold enough, they behave just like rocks. So, um, on that regard, when you heat it with the laser, you don't think it, it moves at all? That's such a short enough. You need to heat it with the laser to achieve your pulse. Yeah. Yeah, it's a sub-100 picosecond time above 100 Kelvin, for that matter. I mean, so these are starting at 50 Kelvin and going to 250 for 10 picoseconds. Uh, so the diffusion distances are very small. Furthermore, we're trying to push to even gentler stuff. And I, I can't say in, in materials that have high mobility, like the gallium nitride, what we have seen is that, indeed, when you start at a lower temperature and heat less, then you eliminate any of those possibilities of movement. And so we think that's the direction to go. And we don't know. We'll see if that works for all materials. Um, how, you mean, how do we reconstruct the 3D structure in the atom? Um, well, if you think of really sim start with a very simple idea that uh, these are atoms just coming from a spherical surface. So they fly radially away from a point. It's a point projection. Our real reality is not that simple, but um, so when we get a hit on the detector, let's say we had a spherical detector that it hit here is just scaled up version of where it was on the surface. Now, if we make a, a planar detector, we just have a simple spherical to planar conversion, which is trivial. Uh, so that, at that level, it's simple. We know from the hit position where it was on the surface. And now another one hits and over here. We know where that one came from. And we position these things. Well, actually, we say, OK, it hit here. Let's put it on that curved surface. We need to know, ideally today, when we do a reconstruction, we say, OK, the, the radius of curvature is, let's say, 45 nanometers. And so we're placing the atoms on a 45 nanometer sphere. And it's like if you went to the beach and built a nice castle, and now you took it apart one piece of sand at a time, and then and stored them and kept track of where they were and we went put them back. That's essentially what we do. We put we start at the bottom and put the atoms back, uh, and that's our reconstruction. 
uh, we just need to do a better job of it. So it's not a spherical end form. So, okay, we try to do what we can, but what we really need is experimental information. That's why we want to get the electron microscope information about what does that surface really look like. And if we know that, that's all we're missing to really put them in the correct positions. So that, that's the whole idea. That's uh, where we're headed, we believe, if we do that. I mean, I, I, I'm humbled by atom probe tomography. It's such a powerful technique. I walked into it after it was already a 3D technique. And uh, you know, our contributions have been more like, how do we speed this up? How do we make this a practical instrument? But now we're saying, OK, it's really good, but it could be better. This is what we need. How do we get there? And I think we can get to that in five years. Did I say that? Well, how, I much your, how much of your effort is on software? You've been talking hardware. Right. Hardware, hardware. But the software seems to be quite a bit Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think it's fair to say that when you start a company and I mean, there's been maybe more hardware emphasis in, in making these instruments because that was, it, it, software doesn't do you any good if you don't have any data. So the first focus was how do we get quality data? All right, yes, now absolutely, I think our bigger challenge is the software. Uh, in fact, there's, there are things we've, Simon again, I keep invoking Simon Ringer here, but he's also been thinking about ways to, to move this whole field forward because, um, you know, probably it's realistic to say the software challenge is bigger than Kamika. We, we have software, we have good software, but we're, the field is moving fast enough that we're not able to put as many resources into keeping it up and making it uh, much, much better than is warranted. So we've got to get creative about how to really get this done. I mean, we can't, again, can't have megabuck software uh, I mean, if I went and hired 20 software engineers, we would, would, would have the job done. But that's not a, a realistic scenario for a company like Kamika. So, um, so we, are, we are, in fact, trying to ramp up our software effort. Uh, and the, the Atom project, by the way, one of the major thrusts of that would be not just hardware, but uh, data mining. Really making it so that, uh, well, fixing reconstruction, but then once you've got quality information, also data mining and making it so that Harold Frost could go to the atom probe and say, I need to know the, you know the Gibbs excess at this interface, and it'll give it to you. And you don't have to be so expert to do that, because you're moving on to other things, right? So that is something absolutely we're conscious of. We want to do that. Um, but in a sense, we're, you know, we're 10 years into a commercial instrument. Uh, I think we've made a lot of progress. I'd like to see where the next 10 years will get us. And I hope to be able to tell you in 10 years, yes, we've We've been uh, able to address your concern there. Oh, thank you.